Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Holmberg. I'm the Filson Historical Society curator. Thank you for joining us in person and virtually as we do our so many of our lectures now for today's initial 2023 Filson Fridays lecture series, which is staff led and allows viewers to learn about their areas uh, of expertise and interest in the collections and history here at the Filson. Uh, it's something I know the staff looks forward to doing each, each summer and something we've been doing for a long time. Thank you again for joining us for Transcribing Family Documents, Where to Start. Today's program is sponsored by Dinsmore Family Wealth Planning. After the lecture, if you have questions, well, I'm sure we'll have time for some questions. If you would come up to one of the two microphones on each side, and I'll, uh, I'll help moderate those questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Patrick Lewis. Dr. Patrick Lewis is a Director of Collections and Research for the Filson Historical Society and co-editor of the Ohio Valley History Journal. A Trigg County native, he graduated from Transylvania University and holds a PhD in history from the University of Kentucky. He previously worked for the National Park Service and the Kentucky Historical Society and has won grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the James Graham Brown Foundation. Lewis is author of For Slavery and Union, Benjamin Buckner and Kentucky Loyalties in the Civil War, University Press of Kentucky 2015, and co-editor of Playing at War, Identity and Memory in American Civil War Era Video Games, under contract with LSU Press. While at KHS, one of his duties was serving as the director of Civil War Governors of Kentucky, a digital documentary edition project. Go to its website to be immersed in the documentary legacy of Kentucky's Union and Confederate gubernatorial administrations. Patrick, like many historians, has read and transcribed more historical documents, especially handwritten documents, than he can probably remember and is the perfect person to counsel people where to start with their family papers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis. Thanks a lot, Jim. Yeah, we are just gonna kind of deal with where to start. Um, so you all do have handouts that hopefully you picked up when you came in. If you've not gotten one, or if you wanna pick up extras for some friends, Go out and see uh, Jamie and Shelby out in the uh, the entryway. For those of us uh, joining online, uh, we'll put a link to a PDF of this handout in the chat, um, so you can access that as well. Um, so you can uh, you can follow along. We're going to roughly follow that order, but I'm not going to read individual bullet points, so don't worry about that. Um, so thanks to to Jim for listing um, uh, some of the work that I've done, particularly with the Civil War Governors of Kentucky project. We're going to uh, kind of walk through some of the editorial projects that I've worked on professionally, uh, and then I'll kind of reflect on some of the lessons that I've learned that would help um, you all if you want to start um, transcribing, editing, publishing even uh, a set of, of family uh, documents, records, whatever those might be. And then uh, we'll actually end up uh, circling back around and talking about a family project of mine um, that I've been kicking around uh, the, for the past little while. And that's, that's that one right there. Um, so this talk was born out of a program that we did last fall when we had uh, an NEH grant uh, to uh, relaunch the first American West project. So uh, this was a, a major initiative that we did um, back in the early 2000s and then uh, got all that data back up online last year. Uh, part of that was taking some of the uh, manuscript collections from the Filson's holdings of early Kentucky materials and putting those onto a uh, crowdsourcing transcription site um, called From the Page, uh, where we had individual members and people all over the world uh, transcribing those documents. And then we, we um, scraped those transcriptions and put those into our Omeka uh, system for you to read right now. And so we were given a talk with uh, Brumfield Labs, the people who run From the Page, Ben and Sarah Brumfield, and they were talking about some of the different uh, really exciting transcription projects that are happening um, on their website. Um, this website 
which has clients all over the world transcribing legal records, military records, family papers, kind of you name it, in multiple languages, um, in, in Western and non-Western scripts, amazing piece of software, um, was born out of a family transcription project. So Ben Brumfield had his family uh, farm diaries and correspondence. He wanted to find a way uh, for his family uh, spread all across the U.S. to be able to participate uh, in, in uh, transcribing those documents. Uh, and so he and Sarah, both being software developers, uh, built a thing for their own personal use, and then they built a thing for everybody else to use. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty magnificent. And so after we, uh, we had that talk last fall, Paul Glenn Tall, a Filson member, emailed me and said, uh, that was great, but I would really love a workshop about um, transcribing your family documents. Here we are. Thanks, Glenn. So as I said, um, this is kind of uh, what uh, I think of as kind of our, our professional setup. Uh, from the page does have uh, the option for you to uh, to upload your own small collection and begin transcribing on that. But for a lot of people, that's that's really overkill. Um, what I want to communicate to everybody here is, uh, you know, you don't need to think about um, having a, a, a professional process. You have the tools um, sitting in your home office. You've got them sitting in your pocket. Um, you know, you've got them in your laptop and your iPad and everything else. You can get this done. Um, but think about organization and structure. Um, and that's what uh, we need to do here. I think the first thing we need to think about is who is your audience going to be? Who are you doing this for? Who wants to see this? Is this just for your own personal interest? Um, then that can be as low maintenance as a Word document. Um, you know, is this for your family to share? Uh, do you want to print up a copy of this and donate it to a, a local library like the Filson? We love things like that. Um, you know, uh, take that to Kinko's, get that spiral bound. Uh, that's a fantastic resource for us to have. Uh, do you think that this might be of interest to publish, right? Could you, uh, could you uh, put this in front of a local press or a, or a university press? Would these letters be of interest to somebody else? Um, would this be something that you would want to put on the internet? A lot of really excellent projects have been able to start up using just basic WordPress pages, right? It's got individual posts and those can become individual documents. You can uh, track metadata, you can do subject tagging, you can have multiple editors uh, going in there and, and creating changes. You have track changes so that you, you get version control over time. You do have to make sure that, you know, WordPress isn't your only solution, right? You want a, you want a physical copy, you want another copy that doesn't live on somebody else's server somewhere, but that's a pretty quick and easy publication medium for you. So think about what you're going to do with this first. That's going to make some choices for you. And then you start assessing your materials. What do you have? And here I'm going to tell a story uh, about this diary. This is an editorial project that I worked on at KHS uh, before I came to the Filson. This is a, a diary of Claude Likens. Uh, he was a Kentuckian who was captured by the Japanese during World War II. And this is his diary from uh, prison camp. Uh, when he was being held prisoner for multiple years. Um, the question that you should ask yourself is, is transcription of these materials really the best way to work with them, right? Is there some other way that I can, I can deal with these materials? And the Lycan's Diary I found very interesting because um, it is uh, a textual object. Yeah, it's a diary he wrote in it. But um, when you edited and published it, uh, it, it, uh, there were real questions about whether this really provided the best way of understanding and appreciating this historical artifact. Um, and, and the long and the short of that is you can kind of look, these are page proofs. Um, so this is actually in the middle of the editorial process um, when we had the manuscript uh, just about lined up um, and we're making some final edits. Some of this is in English. These are addresses of fellow prisoners that Claude meets. Uh, some of these are word lists in Japanese. Some of these are, you can see Morse code in there. Um, there's, uh, there are multiple scripts. There are both Japanese and Chinese characters um, that are being recorded in here. 
uh, the editorial work on this one was really complex because obviously we had to have somebody who was familiar with those languages to be able to proof and check this. And then we had to determine, you know, uh, were these, um, were these, you know, Claude's introduced grammatical errors? What, what's going on here, right? Because he doesn't understand Japanese all that well. He's learning. What we realized over the course of doing this work is uh, Claude was, in a lot of cases, um, you know, keeping this sort of Japanese word list, not only as a practical means of communicating with his captors uh, and his guards, but also as cover, right? Because uh, keeping diaries like this was, uh, was, was not allowed for prisoners, right? He could be faced with very severe punishment by these Japanese prison guards. And so this was a, a means of, of cover. So um, think about whether or not this, you know, the, the work that you're going to put into transcribing and annotating a thing is, is really the best uh, sort of use of this, uh, this material collection. If you want to talk about, um, you know, long-term preservation of some of your family materials, the Filson Friday series in years past have done other lectures uh, about this, um, you know, give us a call at the reference desk. We're happy to talk with you about how best to preserve some of these things, but maybe transcription isn't right for a thing just because it's text. So think about the, the different materials that you might work with. Letter collections are the first things that come to mind, uh, but you could also have diaries, uh, farm ledgers, uh, financial books, um, legal uh, documents, land records, all that kind of stuff could be of interest to transcribe uh, and publish. Uh, and then think about how you're gonna organize those things. It usually chronologically makes sense. You could also organize um, your, your um, sort of publication by subject, uh, by sender or recipient. Um, you could organize that archivally, right? So, um, you know, which pieces of this are grouped together in an archival collection if your family's materials are somewhere like the Filson. This one was pretty easy. It's a bound volume. You flip through it. Page by page, it's one unit. Um, there are some questions about the alignment of different things because he didn't always write um, in columns. And, and obviously when you're dealing with non-Western writing systems, then there's some directionality involved here. And you think about how to render that on a page. Um, again, those are legitimate things to think about at the outset, just sort of assess what you're gonna work with. Be selective. You don't have to publish everything. You don't have to transcribe everything. Um, you know, take a look at what you have and see if it really fits your mission, if it fits your intended audience. Um, so this is uh, an example from uh, the project that Jim mentioned, the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition, um, where I worked for a long time uh, before coming here to the Filson. Um, this was an artificial collection. Uh, so we were assembling uh, an archive out of many archives. So we went to libraries and archives across the state. We looked through all of their holdings uh, for things that were to or from a Union or Confederate governor from November of 1860 to December of 1865. And we, we put all those together. We scanned them. We transcribed them. We began annotating even. You can see the, the highlighted names here. There's a screenshot from the website. You can click on those and you can get a biography of that person things like that. So that is to say we were very selective in doing that. If, if a document did not meet those criteria, we left it in the folder, right? So of the, the currently probably 15,000 items that are uh, available online uh, right now at Civil War Governors of Kentucky, we probably laid hands on two or three times that and did not take those. So narrow your criteria based on your imagined audience. Write out your selection criteria to remind yourself because you will slip. You'll say, oh, but this is really neat. Um, and then that opens uh, the door for other really neat things to sort of creep into your document scope. And that's adding time and labor. That's adding page count. That's adding storage space. You know, whatever, whether you're physically or digitally um, going to make these accessible, um, the more documents you, you include, the more you have to work on them, the more you're going to have to preserve them. Professional editors um, will often calendar documents that they're not transcribing. So if, for example, uh, there were some interesting pieces of correspondence that didn't warrant full uh, transcription and annotation, they might uh, note that there was a letter from Abraham Lincoln to whoever on this date. Um, and you can sort of uh, create those lists out. That provides a more complete uh, record of the whole body of correspondence that you're just highlighting a little bit of. 
that may or may not make sense for you. In a family context, it probably doesn't, but it might. And then think about your transcription team. Who's going to do this work with you? And if you're doing it by yourself, you have to think of your, of, of your work process um, like you are multiple people. Right. Um, I, you know, we did a lot of the, the, the editorial work on civil war governors using Google docs and Google drive. Um, these are absolutely magnificent. Um, Google docs are fantastic. You can be in there editing with multiple people at the same time with Google drive. You can store images, you can organize them, you can create folders, you can share that with anybody. You can lock down permissions and say, who's allowed to open these things, who's allowed to edit these documents. Um, it's a great way to sort of build a small community of people who can work in the same space virtually, even if they're not physically present. That also then raises the question of what are you transcribing from? Are you working on from the original? Is it sitting right there in front of you? Um, that's fine if you're working on your own, but of course, if you're going to work with a team of people, if you've got cousins who want to uh, do this work alongside you, you're going to have to make some copies, right? Um, now, um, it is easiest to make digital copies of that. Um, your iPhone is probably good enough to take an image uh, that they can transcribe from. Um, don't count on your working image that you're you know, using to generate these transcriptions being good enough to publish or, or stable enough long-term to create a, a permanent uh, archival copy. But quick and dirty, if you wanna get somebody started next week, go up there and snap some photos on your, on your iPhone, drop them in a Google folder. Um, and you know, your brother across the country can be transcribing next week. Uh, if you do have digitization questions, about taking family materials, scanning those, preserving those, how to, to sort of organize file structures, file naming, file formats, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Danielle Spelinka last year during this series did an absolutely incredible uh, talk that's available on our YouTube page. The link is written down there in the, uh, in the notes too. Whether you're working alone or whether you're working with a team of people, have a review plan. And this is where I, I, I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, how many times are you going to have to lay eyes on each of these documents? This right here probably had about five people touch it before it, it saw light. Um, so, you know, do your first pass of transcription uh, and think about having at least two more rounds of review before you've ironed out all of the kinks before you've gotten all the weird things about capitalization, punctuation, strange terminology you don't know, names you don't know. Um, when I was at Civil War Governors, we were hitting an average of about three or four documents per hour that an average staff member was able to transcribe. Um, that varied, obviously. Uh, a, a, sh a short note on a scrap of paper um, would go pretty quickly. A uh, 15 page petition with 500 names, it's going to take you a little bit longer, right? But on average, think about three to four documents uh, per hour, and every stage of review that you do will take that long again, and it should. So we would do um, a round of, of just textual review, then we would do uh, markup, identifying uh, individuals, then we would do an oral double proof where one person would read the original and another person sitting across the room not looking at the original would look at the transcription, the way we punctuated um, everything, the way we uh, did, you know, superscripts and um, rendered every textual element on that page. Is that overkill for the purposes of, of a family collection? Yeah, probably. Um, but just know that that's, that's a, a, a door that is open to you if you'd like to, to do that. All of those things uh, suggest, what are you going to do with your transcription policy? This is the one rule that, that you need to set, um, but just know that there are no hard and fast rules about how you have to deal with all of the elements that you see on a page. And in fact, you know, the, the deep level of detail in your transcription policy is going to be driven by the nature of the documents you have, whether they're handwritten, whether they're typed, um, whether they're mixed, um, how many 
insertions, deletions, strike throughs, um, gaps in the page, ink blots, all that kind of messy stuff that is more than just words on, on the page um, that you're going to have to deal with. For First American West, we went real simple, right? This was all we set up. This was the, the default transcription um, suggestions in from the page, and it worked just fine for us. Use original spelling if possible. Retain original capitalization, which is always an interesting journey in the 18th century. Uh, use original punctuation when possible. You can go off the deep end and try and determine if that's an M dash or an N dash, um, if that's a common or a semicolon, or if they've underlined this or struck through it. All that's up to interpretation. Some of that's worth a little bit of thought, but not too terribly much. These are screenshots from, or these are these are not screenshots. I'm sorry, I'm I'm dealing in a different world. These are photocopies from a book that I made a long time ago before we did screenshots of everything. Um, by uh, by Stevens and Berg. I've got the full citation at the end of this document. Um, this is a, a handbook that was published by the Association for Documentary Editing, the AASLH, um, in in the late '90s. And this is, if you're really, really serious about doing some transcriptions of family documents and you want more than my little handout here, uh, go online and pick up a copy of this. You can get them dirt cheap used. Um, the thing that I love about this is for every stage of the editorial process, and this was a manual that was, was meant for academic publishers who are, who are taking archival collections like you'd find at the Filson and turning those into uh, you know, published scholarly authoritative editions of, uh, of those works that anybody across the world could use. Um, they just took examples from all the different editions that were out um, at the time. And the thing that I love here is there are no hard and fast rules, right? They give you example after example and after example, and every one of them have made different choices. They've made choices that made sense for the documents that they're working with, for the era that they're working with, for the intended audience of scholars that they are writing for, publishing for. Be consistent, but don't feel like you have to be uh, bound by, by the, the standards that somebody else set. Take inspiration, but don't feel locked in. This is the, the statement of uh, transcription policy. This is not the, the internal transcription policy, but the public uh, sort of, if you think of as the digital front matter uh, for Civil War Governors of Kentucky that talks about some of the ways that we deal with this. Um, when we don't know, but we're taking a guess. When we absolutely don't know, um, when there's a gap and there's a tear in the page and we just, we just can't read, um, when there are notes that get stuck in somewhere, when there are seals, when there's text within a seal, right? We're dealing with governor's documents, right? They put seals on everything, right? They stamp everything. Um, so that's just kind of how um, you should expect to read those in the transcription. Of course, now going back to that, that image that we saw earlier, um, you know, for the most part, a user on the Civil War Governor's website will have the document right next to them, but um, you could download, in theory, those, uh, those transcriptions without those images, and you could use them still. One of the things that uh, was very, very helpful for us uh, at Civil War Governors, especially as we onboarded new staff, as we onboarded new graduate students, new interns and volunteers, um, we created letter charts, um, especially for our, our uh, five principal governors, um, one of whom had absolutely atrocious handwriting. Um, James F. Robinson, Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, worst handwriting in the 19th century. Um, give him a medal. Um, and so we would go through, and especially for capital letters, know how they make their capitals. We got to learn really well all of the governor's secretaries, the principal military clerks that were working in the, the state adjutant general's office, the quartermaster general's office in Frankfurt, um, got to know those guys real well and their hands real well. Um, identifying capitals especially is going to be really helpful. Names are the things that will trip you up because you usually get one shot at them. 
right? You can look in context for other words that might appear. You know, uh, how does he say, how does he write and? How do they write the? You can find another example of that. You might only get one shot at a name, especially if it's a signature. So that's the, the, the toughest part there. Um, think about the technology that's producing these documents that you're working with. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, I got, um, a, a, a steel nib pen and, an, and ink and taught myself to write in grad school because I had to learn to read all this stuff very quickly when I was doing archival research. Right. So, um, I got an appreciation for where I would get lazy and, and, and blur words together, not make a full loop on a letter, but just sort of do some stringy things. That's going to affect your uh, interpretation of how literal they're being with spelling lots of times in the 19th century. And we do this today, right? Um, you know, you write the first two letters of a word really clearly, something, something, something in the middle and the last two letters of the word. And you know what that is. They knew what that was. If you're familiar with the technologies producing these documents, then, then you're going to know a little bit better what they're doing. Um, so uh, that's a, a, a thing that might be overkill, but I found it really helpful to, to that tactile experience of having handled um, those materials that are producing these documents that I was reading pretty consistently. This is not going to get into how you read 19th century handwriting, 18th century handwriting, German manuscript handwriting. Um, it, you know, there are, there are resources online that you can, you can learn. Um, you can look at handwriting manuals. There's a big um, sort of handwriting stylistic shift that happens in the mid 19th century. Um, you can tell the age of people or when they went to school based on their handwriting. <clears throat> That's really fascinating. Um, all of that is knowable. You can figure that out. And then you've got to find out somebody's individual quirks. I'm not going to go into that. Good luck to you. Good luck to your, your kids and your grandkids that did not um, get taught cursive. Good luck to the grad students that we have walking in the door and working at the Filson right now. Um, they're, they're behind the eight ball. They almost need a, a, a 19th century paleography class anyway. Think about annotation. So annotation is the way that you provide context to the transcription. So after you've produced the words on the page, right? You want to help your reader, again, be that somebody in your family, or somebody who's going to walk into a reading room like the Filson and pull this printed volume that you've produced off the, the shelf. Um, I want to know who the proper nouns are. Who are the people? Where are the places? What are the events? Can you clarify the context in this letter, right? Who's a sender? Who's the recipient? Generally speaking, you know, a footnote at the first mention of a person, place, thing, event, whatever, um, is uh, best. We tend to run down literary allusions, biblical allusions. Um, those are really helpful. Um, if you can discern events, um, that's really fantastic. Um, all of that is, is the genealogical research that most of you know how to do really well. That's Ancestry in Fold 3. Um, that's, you know, using reference works like the Louisville Encyclopedia, the Kentucky Encyclopedia to sort of get an understanding of what's going on here. Sometimes you've got to go really, really deep. Um, if there are legal terms, if there are special agricultural terms, if you need to understand the, I don't know, the, 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 annual calendar of how a Kentucky hemp plantation works, what they should be expecting to do when, um, you know, if you need to know when you should top tobacco, you can go research all that. I wanted to highlight this um, editorial project. Again, another one that I did at KHS before I came to the Filson. This is uh, part two of Josie Underwood's diary. Josie um, was a young woman from Bowling Green, uh, alive during the Civil War, the daughter of a former congressman, unionist family. Uh, the first volume of her diary had been published by the University Press of Kentucky a few years before this. Uh, and after that had seen print, um, a family member said, huh, I've got the other half of that and sent it to Western's library. Nancy Baird, the, the librarian there, uh, produced a typescript and, and sent it to the register for publication. And so a lot of the work that we did was expanding on the work um, of the first volume and really identifying all of the new people, places and things. 
that happened in this second diary. And this one was really fascinating. Josie went uh, from Bowling Green after the rebels uh, evacuated the city in February of 1862. They burned down her family's plantation house. Her father gets appointed to be a U.S. consul in Scotland. Uh, and so Josie and family all go uh, for a grand European adventure, mostly in Glasgow. They eventually come back to Bowling Green and end up going all the way out to California by the end of the war. So we had a globe-spanning uh, annotation job to do. And so we went through um, and identified on each of these pages of our manuscript um, what were the new items that we had to identify. And about three weeks later, I produced this document, a couple of pages of which are here. Um, and you can see that, you know, that was that was taking advantage of everything from the previous version of the diary that had already been published, the first volume, U.S. Census. We had to go into ship captains. Uh, we had to look at uh, British censuses. We had to look at the uh, Glasgow newspaper to understand who was performing when she said she went to the theater. We were able to find out all of these people. She says she mentioned plays. She says she saw an opera. Who was playing that night? We can do that. Uh, the local, uh, she says she went to a hunt meet. What was the, the local hunt in, uh, in Glasgow? We were able to, to find that information, right? Uh, again, biblical allusions, literary allusions. She goes on this whole Walter Scott tour um, through Scotland, which is basically the same like tourist trail that you go on now is all those same sites she did and she loved it. It was romantic, capital R. She, she's a teenage girl. She, she loves it. Um, so decide how much of this makes sense for you and for your collection. You know, at the very least, you want to be able to identify who these people are. You want to be able to establish their connections back to you if they're family members. You want, you know, your family to understand that that genealogical line of descent down to you. How does their life affect us in the present? How does this story of, of what they're doing on this farm in this county affect, you know, us here now living in Louisville? But there's also some really incredible stuff that can come to light here, right? The, the uh, uh, a fairly straightforward text with mentions of Mrs. Smith and we went to church today. You can you can really build on that if you've got the resources. And again, fortunately, most of that stuff is digitized right now. I didn't go to Scotland for any of this stuff, right? I used digitized newspapers. I used Ancestry. Um, I used uh, databases of of British shipping in the 1860s. Uh, to pull all this stuff together. You can do that too, if you really want to. And I think it's neat. Which brings me finally, and I'll, I'll wrap here, and then I want to leave plenty of time for you all to ask questions as well uh, to my own family project, right? Uh, so taking all of this experience that I have, all of this stuff that I've done, as Jim mentioned, I don't know how many documents I've laid hands on and transcribed at this point. Um, it's well over 20,000. Um, and working with the pension application of my first known Kentucky ancestor, uh, Leonard Anderson, um, who comes to Logan County in the 1790s. Uh, and his family is still there. Uh, it's my mom's family. This one is particularly fascinating because, uh, again, at, at 1832, and he's born in the 1750s, he's pushing 80 at this point. And you can see um, in the year 1776 or 1777, he thinks, for being very old and illiterate, he cannot speak with certainty. Um, and that kind of defines this document. He's all over the place chronologically. If you were to read this document, and have an understanding of the Revolutionary War as it happened in the South in the late 1770s, early 1780s. This is nonsense. It's all over the place. He's just pulling associated memories at random because he's almost 80. This was a long time ago <laughs> that he's giving this deposition. Um, and you can see the processes of memory taking place here. 
Um, I've also been able to sort of triangulate this document um, with others uh, where he serves as uh, a, 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 a sworn witness to other neighbors of his um, who are applying for pensions in Kentucky in the 1830s, who also served with him in the Carolinas in the 1780s, right? And so there are additional details that he will layer in there. You can just imagine these, these old men sitting around and having conversations about the war, uh, and then they, they all walk into the lawyer's office and swear out uh, their depositions that are going to go to DC for approval. Um, and, and again, you know, the text here is, is interesting. The amazing part is what comes out in the annotation. And, you know, I'm, I'm able to uh, start to decipher some of this. Uh, he did not enlist in 1776 or 1777. Um, as I found, you know, at best, um, probably 78 or 79. Um, he comes in, but I've been able to to, to really triangulate the point in Virginia military recruiting where he does it in the army. He mentions enough names here and enough places that I'm able to, to understand how he comes into uh, a draft of replacements that are meant to go up to Washington's army in the mid-Atlantic, uh, but as the war shifts into the, the Carolinas, into the deep south, um, is sent there. Uh, and then he spends the rest of his war chasing Loyalist and Bannister Tarleton through the swamps in the Carolinas. Really fascinating, um, you know, stories. I'm able to use um, George Washington's correspondence, which has been through the work of other editors doing very similar projects, um, transcribed, put online. I'm able to understand the command decisions that are shaping, you know, uh, my ancestors' military service, um, and. I will say here as well, just in a in a um, sort of spirit of true transparency, I did not think through my audience before I began doing this work. Um, I found a a, a transcription um, of this pension file online. Somebody had already you know taken this this scan microfilm that's available on Fold Three. Um, and produce this transcription. I went through it and verified, particularly names, making sure that they transcribe those more or less right. Looks pretty good. Um, and then I just started for my own interest, trying to piece this narrative together. Only when I got kind of deep into it, did I realize that there might be something more here. And so I started taking these footnotes that started out as being notes to myself and started putting those in a format where this could one day be published. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking one day maybe this will go into Ohio Valley history, um, perhaps as uh, a document that stands on its own, perhaps as a version of this uh, this workshop where we talk a little bit about the process that goes into how did I how did I do this research and things like that. Um, the really important part is I started doing something. And that's really what I want to to leave you all with. Make some decisions, stay organized. Uh, but the most important thing is, is get started and you'll have the resources at hand. So um, I'll leave uh, formal remarks off there. And then please, if you do have questions so that our folks on the recording can hear, uh, please come up and use the, the mics on the side there. Okay, any questions, just come on over to the mic and, and ask. And I'll also, I know some have been coming in from the chat. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, see if I can get this here. I'll do until somebody out in the audience is uh, here's one from Tro Troy Plummer. He says, what's the best way for a novice to store paper diaries over decades and centuries that are old? What's the best way for somebody to, to store documents that are, are centuries old? Um, Acid-free cardboard boxes. Um, are the easiest answer. Um, but environmentally, where you put those is as important as what you put them in. Keep them dry. Uh, keep them in low humidity areas. Do not stick them in the garage. Uh, keep them away from pests, bugs. You know, that kind of infestation can eat through paper. Um, yeah, uh, treat them, uh, you know, treat them as, as valued members of the household. Bring them inside where they can be air conditioned uh, and not get wet. Uh, do not wrap them in plastic. 
because the plastic will trap in moisture and that just produces mold, right? Um, but uh, but you can go on uh, on Amazon and and search for uh, acid free uh, archival quality um, supplies, boxes, folders, that sort of thing, uh, and that will go a long long way. But environmental control first and foremost. Leslie asks. Shouldn't descriptions of places adhere to the applicable jurisdiction of the time? That is to say, the colony or province before formation of the U.S. and then the pre-statehood reference. I see annotations and descriptions of transcripts that use current county, state, and country names, but that seem to, but that seems to be misleading. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So the the question is, do we? Uh, do we use the historical place and and sort of sorting and jurisdiction or the contemporary ones? I like both, actually, because I feel like for a contemporary reader, I want to know what is this place now if I wanted to go there uh, and see that. But I also, in the same way that I love looking at old maps, um, I love understanding that that, you know, this part, this you know, place was once part of a different county, uh, was once part of a different state, was once a territory, was once part of a different empire. Maybe um, I think that that's really important. I know we ran into this all the time in Civil War governors um, of Kentucky because we had um, obviously new states being formed uh, during the period of this. Fortunately, Kentucky did not create any new counties uh, during the war. It had just created a cluster in 1860, and it would create some more just afterwards. But we at least had a stable number of counties to work in. But that didn't mean that Kentucky places were always in the same counties, right? There were some there's some additional creation there. 10 additional counties. Um, I remember the, the one that threw us the most was um, we had one of the last postmarked letters that came from Denver, Kansas territory uh, before Colorado territory was uh, was carved off uh, before Kansas statehood. Um, so that sent us on a, on a morning of research and said, is there a Denver, Kansas that we don't know about? Or is this the Denver that we all think about? Right. Mm -hmm. So that note explains that history. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to do both. It's a great question, though. Leslie goes on to ask another question. What do you think of Ancestry.com as a third part party repository of digitized or transcribed family documents with appropriate source and transcription information? Ancestry is a really great place, I would say, to share your transcribed documents with people who you might want to, to run into and make some family history connections with, but I would not depend on it from a preservation uh, standpoint. You're, you're giving your data to somebody else and you never know what they're going to do with it. Um, so I would advise, yeah, if you want to post it up there and share and see who also relates to this family document, yeah, absolutely. I've done the same thing. Um, but, you know, make sure, and this is where um, Danielle Spalinka's talk from last summer is really, really fantastic, uh, talking about how you keep multiple redundant copies, what file formats are digitally the most stable over time, which ones are least likely to uh, degrade digitally. Um, and uh, that's especially the case for images. Text files are really easy. The simpler, the better. Um, you know, just drop uh, basic text files into into the word pad if you're on a, a Windows computer. Um, that's that's even more stable than Word will be down the line. But uh, as as simple as possible, and keep your own copies both digitally um, in the cloud and physically as well. If you really really don't want to lose them. As a, I'll I'll mention one as a kind of an add on to the ancestry question is the importance of going back to the original yeah. to double check the mm -hmm. transcription. And I know if everybody's been, I'm sure using Ancestry, is the number of errors you can encounter by names and dates and that's just a transcription error, they read it wrong. And going back to that original can be very important. So something that, that everybody should look at and think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the the fascinating things in editing the the Josie Underwood diary was that um, the original of the first volume didn't exist. Um, it had only existed, or it has not been found yet. 
it could still pop up somewhere. But there was only a TypeScript that was in the hands of Western. Uh, and so there were legitimate questions that we had as we had access to the manuscript original. And we could make those sorts of queries. And, you know, we would we would call down to Bowling Green and say, like, all right, on page such and such, is that a, a you know, a this or a that? Um, on this line, we can't determine this name. And so then when that information, those guesses would differ from the TypeScript of the original, we had real questions about, is this the same person that's being talked about in each volume, or is that a typo in the TypeScript? And, and at present, presuming that that first volume in manuscript never reappears, that's going to be an open-ended question forever. But yeah, you, you absolutely do. And that's, again, um, you know, don't... Uh, you know, don't be ashamed to go back and review your work and review your transcriptions. Um, and don't, don't do your review pass through a letter or a document as soon as you finish transcribing it the first time. Let that sit. Go through the whole corpus. Do the whole thing. Do, do one full round of transcription of everything you've got because the next time you go back, you're going to have a better idea of the people involved, the events involved, the penmanship. Um, you're going to come back with different eyes. You are going to be a different person and you're going to catch new things. Um, you're going to know that ah, I've seen that name in another place and you're going to be able to, to correlate that and fix your errors. Um, so, so really give time if you don't have another, you know, person or group of people who are working on you. The best thing is, is, you know, pass off your work to somebody else and have them proof it for you. Cause another, another brain and another set of eyes is ideal, but you can with time sort of give yourself that space and be that accurate too. Thinking of the many names and places you encountered in the Kentucky Civil War Governors Project, uh, do you have a favorite letter or document that just really stuck with you? Oh, man. Um, this was always, so there, I mentioned the Association for Documentary Editing, which is an organization that uh, I love and was involved with for many years. Um, and this is a conference of people every year that get together in the summer and talk about doing this all the time. Um, so, you know, if you ever wanted to, to show up to that and do this for three days, um, they've got a conference every summer. Um, and so editors would always bring your most, uh, hair raising stories. Oh, believe me, I've got some tales about civil war Kentucky, um, that I'm not gonna, gonna have recorded, uh, today. If we want to talk about those later, we can, uh, we had a running file of funny names of pun names, um, of really uh, creepy and disturbing things um, that we saw um, happen all the time. I love this one that I, I showed earlier. Um, so this is from the George Johnson papers at KHS. George Johnson, this guy here, will end up being uh, the first Confederate governor of Kentucky. Uh, this is nothing to do with his gubernatorial administration. This is uh, just after the election of 1860. So you can see it's just barely within scope here. Uh, and you read here, this is from the owner of the Galt House, uh, who says that, um, that uh, Mr. Johnson, a cousin, um, has bet on John C. Breckinridge winning the election of 1860, and now he's got to pay up. He passed off a check that George had given to WV, um, but he's not endorsed it. So can you write me a check so I can cash this in, right? And this is, this is mild for wartime Kentucky, uh, where everybody is mildly drunk. Everybody has a knife um, and everybody gambles on everything. And they hadn't even started shooting at each other yet. <laughs> All right. Oh, go ahead, sir. It's about archiving. Information. Mm -hmm. So if you go to an archive, you gather information you want for transcription purposes. Do you have to give credit to that organization? That's a really excellent question. So the question is um, archival permission. Um, generally speaking, it is, uh, it is a, a, a good practice, even if you're just transcribing and not reproducing images. Yeah. To, to credit that archive and say that you got them from there. You do not have to have explicit permission because that transcription is your work of, of, uh, intellectual creativity. Um, now if you do want to have, uh, images of that, then yeah, you're going to have to abide by whatever the rules the, the archive has for copying and, and making those images, you know, here at the Filson by and large, we would say, uh, you know, if you walked in there with your, your cell phone and you snap some photos of a collection in, uh, in a reading room and said that you were only going to use it for personal research, um, and not reproduce those in a publication that's fair use. Yeah. 
but yeah, that'll, that'll kind of depend. And, and I will say too, think about that ahead of time um, because that has gotten some of the larger um, editing projects, um, not in trouble necessarily, but they had to, to do some work that they didn't want to have done by not securing rights to reproduce those images. Uh, and this was especially troublesome for projects that started um, in the, the pre-digital era when they went to these places and they got photocopies. Um, and yet expecting only that they would transcribe and those would stay in the office and nobody would ever see those. Um, and then at some point when they got scanners, they said, we'll go out and we'll, we'll make scans, but they didn't think to update the rights and the usage. And so then now that they had all these scans, somebody said, well, we can put those all on the internet, right? No, you can't. Because the agreement for making those scans by and large was just for research use. Um, and so some of those larger projects had to go out and track down the owners of those documents. That's one thing when it's a place like the Filson and we're always going to be here and you can write to us and we're always going to give you an answer. Um, for collections uh, that were in private hands that might have been sold, um, you know, where those, those owners are no longer um, reachable to get that expanded permission set, then those are images that, that can't see the light of day. So you just got to think ahead a little bit if you want to do images. You know, I see that you have the original document and the transcribed document. Is it important? Like I have many, many letters from my mother from 1935 to 1986. I've scanned those letters, but I want to transcribe. Mm -hmm. Should I leave the original letter and the transcribed in the same document or do I hmm. this, this is a really great um point about your setup of your workspace um as well as your file structure um you know so I think it is by far easiest to have your original on one side and your transcription that you're working in in a different file um looking side by side so your eyes have to bounce back and forth um, if you can do that on a separate device, we had at, at um, CWGK, we had two massive monitors. And so you could have the document blown up really big on one side and you could have your, your whole editorial window open on another side. Um, and that made life really easily. In general, though, yeah, keep your, keep your transcription and your, your image document separate. Yeah, but once, once I put it on a written document, mm -hmm. should I have the, the original you know, show both? It depends. Once, Sometimes it's important to. Okay, and you use annotations. What about paraphrasing what you see in a letter? Yeah, I think that's also really helpful too. Um, yeah, so instead of dropping footnotes or linking um, in with the text, um, you know, a lot of a lot of really successful editorial projects will do short, you know, paragraph level introductions for an individual document or for a chapter head or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes that's that's easy, especially when you've got a, a sort of a known and limited set of characters it's a lot easier there. And when you can expect the, the reader to be moving more or less, you know, sort of page by page with you through a volume um, or through that, you know, that was not really an, a good option for us at Civil War Governors because, you know, in theory, you could always hit next item, next item, next item. But in practice, you were doing a keyword search on our website, Google was dropping you right in there, uh, and you needed everything you could to help understand the world of this document right here on this one web page. So again, that, that's a little bit dependent on, on your audience and your format. Great questions, though. <clears throat> And uh, once you've written your family tree and you've turned it into a book, mm -hmm. um, how can you expand your audience uh, outside of your state? For instance, I, I wrote a book, 300 pages. Uh, I sold a few hundred copies, which is great. For Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I'm still getting requests for it. Uh, how do you expand online? What I'd like to do is just copy it, mm -hmm. turn it over to somebody to you know, to sell it or if I need to sell it myself, but what options do you have uh, online? Yeah, for online distribution. Um, you know, I think, uh, well, I'm just going to go ahead and say that I'm, um, that's not a world that I have operated much in. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, but in generally, yeah, uh, you know, having some, uh, you know, having a, a, 
a website if you wanted to sell the full collection that that excerpted some of those stories and things like that, um, that excerpted some of those letters, some of those, you know, capsule biographies of some of those individuals gave people an idea of what families and what locations um, were of particular interest. Um, you know, using places like Ancestry and things like that to define those those communities of people that are interested in understanding those families in those locations, um, you know, and and sort of being your own viral marketer there, uh, and uh, and getting word out like that. I will also say, um, sending copies to places like the Filson um, or samples to places like the Filson, your county library, your county historical society, wherever is relevant for that family story. Um, and making places like us aware that that this book is out there and that we should purchase a copy. Uh, that's a great place for like minded people to to run into that. Um, and then at the end of that volume, you know, always make sure that you've got your contact information and, uh, the, you know, the website or the email address or wherever they can go to to look for a copy there. Right? It's just finding an audience who's doing the same work as you and has the same interest. All right, Patrick, thank you very much. So thanks, y'all. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. We got one more. We can do one more. Summer, come on. All right. We got it. At the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the first American West mm -hmm. project, and you described it as a crowdsourcing transcription site. Mm -hmm. Are there similar sites for Civil War letters or for military? persons from the civil war that's a yes um and so on from the page here we go so at this one website from the page that we use to to have our documents transcribed there are projects um from all over the world um, um it's uh, it's in the handout um it is um it's at the bottom of that first section from the page.com um you you know you basically create one uh one account and then you can search for any number of projects that that interest you you know the vast majority of the people who transcribed uh documents on the first american west project had no connection with filson they're just people who like transcribing letters uh and they found our content interesting and they jumped in and they they did it and and so that's one of the great things about what um what from the page has done and i will also say that that ben and sarah brumfield who run this site also have a really extensive blog i linked to um one of their uh, blog posts uh, in the transcription policy section where they give a number of examples of different transcription policies that some of their projects use again to kind of show you the range of what other people are doing so that you can make a choice that's good for you yes from the page. So if you look on page one, uh, about middle of the way down, I've listed two websites from the page and Transcribus. Yeah, that one right there. Um, so in addition to that one blog post, they've got lots of other blog posts um, sort of distilling their experience and the experience of um, other folks who have used their platform. And, and it's really fantastic reading if you're thinking about doing a project like this uh, to sort of get a sense of how other people are doing things. And I would also um, suggest, um, uh, again, the, the Stevens and Berg book, um, Editing Historical Documents, A Handbook of Practice, uh, which is where these came out of. Um, if you if you want something in hard copy that has lots and lots and lots of again professional examples, but um, I, I absolutely love and take great inspiration from filtering through there and seeing all the different ways that you can do this work, and then you, you find what fits you. All right, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all.